Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you had a great night's sleep after that spectacular performance by Al and Stephen last night. That was just marvelous. Thank you. And Bill Lowman coming over to do a couple of cowboy poems. That was just a terrific evening. And just exactly what we like the entertainment portion of a symposium like this to be. Um, this is the eighth annual symposium. This is the first time that all the scholars have stayed. Right. Now, usually some of them stay, but scholars, as you know, have very busy lives elsewhere, and many times they have to leave. This is the first time in all this time that everyone's been able to stay. We have this almost a crowd of scholarship up here. <laughs> um, and so and this is your time. This is your time, because when someone was just saying to me out in the lobby, you know, you go to a, a, an event of some sort, and you, you sit 200 feet away and listen to some eminent scholar speaking, and then they go away and you go away. Uh, but this is a chance for you to raise questions that you might not want to ask in the auditorium. It's a chance for the scholars to talk, disagree, have fun, relax. This is the most relaxed part of our symposium. It's my favorite part of the symposium when we get out into the Badlands and really see the country that shaped Theodore Roosevelt. And so I'm really just wanting you to ask your questions and they'll start talking amongst themselves. We have an hour and a little more, about an hour and 35 minutes. And so this is the time to really settle in. And I want to just remind you of who's here, since not all of you perhaps have heard all of them, but we have um, Stephen Levine, sorry, Mike Cullivan, <laughs> uh, who's at Newcastle. Uh, we have Roger D. Silvestro, uh, who's written the book on Roblo and the Bad. And Stephen Levine, our blues guitarist and keynote speaker. <laughs> Uh, Hal Cannon, the uh, founder and director of the Western Folklife Center out in Elko, Nevada, and Dr. Beverly Everett from the uh, Bismarck Band and the Mimiji Symphony. Uh, Michael, uh, I want to start with you. So, if you were a if you were a film director or a producer, and you were about to produce a, a, a Roosevelt, I won't say biopic, but a feature film, a full-length blockbuster feature film on Roosevelt. Given where we now are with Roosevelt studies, how would you go about it? Given where we are now. Yeah, please speak up because I mean we don't have a microphone, so everyone, please speak up if you can. Yeah. Given where we are now, it would have to be a movie about the past lines. You know, or, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, just seeing the landscape out there, I can't think of a better a place to have a big panoramic, uh, you know, picture about a, you know, you know, a cowboy figure and a, and a cowboy figure in this uh, era as well, which would be great because I think. There's been a lot of those cowboy figures that I've mentioned in the talk over the years, and I think that would be a great time to, uh, to to see a new cowboy figure in the 21st century in Roosevelt, as that would be fantastic. Uh, or maybe if it was a biopic, something like uh, Kathleen Dalton's book, which spans the full life of Roosevelt, rather than the Morris uh, first book. I mean, obviously he's got the three, but uh, a biopic that can can do kind of condense, be a bit more condensed on Roosevelt from childhood to to post-presidency and then death as well. It was up to me though. I'd write a, I, you know, I'd like to see a film about uh, the, the last kind of years of Roosevelt's life in World War I, because I think we're at a centennial point now with World War I. Uh, and I think a lot of us uh, in the history profession think that America was uh, a pacifist, uh, mainly nation, and that Woodrow Wilson won the election in 1916 based on he kept us out of war. But you have Roosevelt there shouting from every bully pulpit that he could find, saying that no, we need to we need to be with the Allies in this this grand great war, and so that I think would be a fitting one for th this moment. Uh, you weren't here last year when we talked about um, Roosevelt and the, and the nonpartisan league and prairie populism and so on. But one of the things that we sort of decided with a group of scholars was that that period between 1914 and 1918 brought out some of the best, but all of the worst in Roosevelt, the sort of jingoism, anger, militarism, the kind of a mean-spiritedness almost in some of his public pronouncements. It's a really important part of his life, but it was the part of his life where, where there was more public hostility both towards him and from him than in any other period. It's like it has not been very well explored. I think the, uh, that's a really interesting point. There's the domestic view of Roosevelt, but uh, this kind of turned into looking at people in a transnational view. And Roosevelt in Europe, the way they viewed Roosevelt during those years, 1914 to 1919, was as a great hero. 
Clemenceau writes to Woodrow Wilson and says, you need to get him involved in this war because he is the, everyone in France knows Roosevelt and they, they want to see his face everywhere. Uh, and in, in the British as well, Lloyd George uh, actually uh, wants to get Roosevelt over to recruit British troops into World War I. So it's funny, here in the US, he, there was mixed feelings, probably largely about his, uh, his views on immigrants, I think. That probably would have been the, the most, uh, the least popular views that he had. But in terms of the war itself and his, his stand on it abroad, he was really, really beloved. And that comes out after he dies. When Roosevelt dies, the tributes for him in Europe are as grand as they are here. And there's talk of memorials from conservation groups and from, I mean, Clemenceau goes to his grave in 1921 and weeps. Um, Prince Edward Albert goes to his grave in 1919, not long after he's dead, and weeps. Edward Gray, there's some great footage of this. Edward Gray, the foreign minister of Great Britain, is wearing dark sunglasses, and people said, you couldn't see underneath them, but he was in tears. So he touched Europeans in a way, maybe that America was a bit more divided at that time. And I've been reading this new book, Bully Pulpit, by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which is a wonderful book just out. Um, you've probably seen her on the talk shows and so on, but it's about, it's largely about the progressive era. And it opens with Roosevelt coming back from his year-long safari in Africa, and then he sort of did a grand tour of European capitals before he came back. And he, there are two things you immediately realize. He had become a world historical figure. The world adored Theodore Roosevelt at this point. Wherever he went, there were gigantic crowds, and he was given endowed lectureships at Oxford and the Sorbonne, and given awards. And they, he, it was, he was even a little embarrassed at the, the gigantic world figure that he was suddenly cutting. And then when he came back to the United States, his homecoming in June of 1910 was the most, with the greatest outpouring of any American patriot returning home in our history. It was, it was just an overwhelming love fest of Theodore Roosevelt. He managed to use up a lot of that political capital in the next few years because he was so awful to Wilson. But, and, and the campaign of 1912 damaged him a little bit too. But, but Stephen Levine, I want to turn to you. I've been thinking about you ever since, well, then, of course, last night I was thinking about you with that slide looking on that guitar. That was a, an inspired moment of technical spontaneity. Um, we, we, loved your, we loved your blues riffs, but I've been thinking about you in terms of this symposium because if I were you, I would be thinking, I sure wish I could have come to the symposium before I did my keynote lecture because all these people have been talking about things you were teasing out. So tell us a little bit about your reflections as you've been listening to your colleagues here. Wow. Uh, that's, a broad, that's a broad question. Can you take it anywhere you want? I have a lot of reflections. Oh, here comes the microphone. Good. Uh, oh, now I'll reflect. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? No. Nope. That's all right. I'm loud and abrasive enough anyway. No, we'll get it. Sure. Get it close to your phone. Sure. Check. 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 There's a green light. This is very high to have. I can I can go without it. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll work on the text. Yeah, that's fine. That's speak fine. loud. <laughs> yes. Speak loudly and carry a big stick. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I just on that note, I just saw recently uh, an Obama, an Obama a, a cartoon about Obama, and we had Theodore Roosevelt uh, saying to him. Don't speak that soft. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I'm not speak that soft. So, anyway, what have I learned from the others? I, I, uh, it, it's hard for me to encapsulate all this in one brief talk here, but I learned so much from everyone sitting at this table. I had no idea, okay, my ignorance on display here, about all the my, admittedly minor, I didn't know there were nearly that many movies where Roosevelt appeared, meaning impersonating Roosevelt. I didn't know there were nearly that many. I knew, of course, some of the major ones. Of course, the old lace, more, just one. more volume. More volume, okay. <laughs> so uh, that was one thing that was very interesting to me, and I appreciated the way you categorized the different representations in time of Roosevelt. It really got me thinking about that. And um, particularly those documentaries at the end, which I've watched over and over again, all of them, and use them in my classes as well. I've never really thought of them on the term, in the terms you talk about, talk about how politicized they were, the political perspectives. I never really thought about it in those terms, and I'll revisit them and think about some of the comments 
uh, that you made. Um, and I can talk about everyone's presentation, but swing to the right here on Beverly's uh, presentation, I was especially looking forward to because, frankly, I didn't know that much about Roosevelt's, uh, the, the music in the White House, because most of my research when looking at Roosevelt in the arts has been looking at his letters, looking at what he did, and as I assumed, and I now understand, is that Edith drove most of this activity. There was a lot of music in the White House, but um, there, again, I, and I haven't found it, maybe Clay House, there's not a lot of commentary by Theodore Roosevelt, but you really give you a much better picture of what, the, what, what it was like in the White House, what you know, the, the musical performances, what type of performances were there, um, even how frequently they were. That's just a gap in my knowledge <coughs> because of the angle at which I approached learning about uh, Roosevelt and the arts of the White House. So those are just a few of the things that stand out. This is not the slight how for um, anyone else here. I learned so much, and um, I mean, even not Heather in the audience. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. Maybe that's yet another one. I need to speak even louder. <laughs> um, maybe you won't listen. Turn the lights off. <laughs> so, but anyway, I just want to say I learned also learned this from Heather as a curator at, uh, at Harvard. It's just interesting to hear how information on Roosevelt, which is so abundant, is being dealt with and learning from you, Clay, as well about the digit how you're digitizing things and just how this process is going on and how it's really changing the world for Theodore Roosevelt scholars. And that's one thing that really opened my eyes here as well being at the symposium. I've been following the website and I found letters even on your website, the digital archives, but it just seems like the, um, the gains being made, the improvements being made, the, the facility in which scholars are able to find things, all things Theodore Roosevelt in the future, it's just getting so much better, and that's terribly exciting. So anyway, those are just a couple comments. Just a, just a quick comment before I turn to Beverly, uh, but you know, coming out of what you said, so Sharon and I have spent a lot of time at the Library of Congress now, and we've gotten to know uh, the staff there really well. James Hudson, Dr. Hudson of the Manuscripts Division is our dear friend, and he's come to North Dakota a couple of times. And so we've been there watching them working on other projects, and they've been working, for example, on the Andrew Jackson papers. And Andrew Jackson is a major a president. He's, he's not James Buchanan. He's, he's one of the giants. And yet his paper trail is relatively small. It's a discrete project. It can be done in X number of years. <laughs> Roosevelt is not as big a president in terms of a paper trail as Ronald Reagan or George Herbert Walker Bush. We've been to the, the Ronald Reagan Library and it's warehouse after warehouse of documents. And when they think of digitizing them, Reagan was the last pre-electronic president. So there was no email in, in Ronald Reagan's presidency. And so they have just a gigantic warehouse of physical documents, and they want to digitize them, of course, but they can't really even contemplate this because how do you do it? And you know, they might be a, a memo from uh, Michael Deaver saying we need to install incandescent lights in the state room rather than fluorescent. And so this is not a high value document unless you're talking about technology and the history of the White House. Everything has to be digitized. In the case of Roosevelt, he's the first gigantic president in American history, 150,000 letters, 40 books, this, this huge paper trail. And it's amazing how much of it doesn't get looked at by scholars. You know, scholars go to the same pool over and over and over again because it's what's available, it's what's been categorized. Are we now up and running? Yeah. Okay. So, so we're fortunate in that we have enough of a body of work that there will be new discoveries about Roosevelt, but we also have to face this fact of the gigantism of the paper trail. Right, and that's why, just to follow up on what you said. Is that microphone? Yeah, yeah. I thought I was just speaking loud. I thought I'd learned, but I guess I haven't. There you go. There. That's why, uh, still to this day, when people ask me, you know, did Roosevelt ever say this? Did he ever read this book? Did he ever correspond with this person? I'm always apprehensive to answer a decisive no, just because I haven't found it. What I'll often say is, I haven't, you heard me say this several times through this symposium, I haven't found anything to indicate that. So I'm, I'm never confident because of the the span, the scope of his work and how much he wrote, that maybe I'm just missing that one letter. I spent so many hours in the uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Library microfilms, you know, the 485 rolls, I think it is. 
I mean, basically, I should have just brought a sleeping bag and just stayed there for about four months. It's just, it's, it's endless. It's interesting. But there's just so much that there's always that sense of what am I missing? And I'm hoping through the digitizing of these resources, it'll be easier to find things and we won't feel be as paranoid that we might be missing something very important, you know, as scholars. So, and I just wanted to follow up on that. So, Beverly, let me ask you this question. You sort of came at this, you're not a Roosevelt scholar, you, you know, you're, a, you're an organist and a, and a symphony director, but you agreed to do this for us. And one of the questions that I had and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but, but anyone might want to take this on. Why, why did the Roosevelt's decide to turn the White House into a performing arts center? You know, that they sort of, others had done a little, but they suddenly did it in a gigantic way, as if they were a couple creating the National Endowment for the Arts. How did, where did this come from? I know they were both highly educated, highly cultured people, but it, it, there was not a lot of precedent for doing it on this scale. My sense is that a lot of it came from Edith from this love that she had for music. And I think some of it was the influence of the time. It was a time when um, many people were having pianos in their homes. And, and I spoke yesterday to, I had a similar experience. I forget who said it. I was speaking to the high school students yesterday. I was kind of intimidating. Um, but that, that this was a time where music was a part of people's daily life. And, in a, a way that they were actually creating it because not everyone obviously had radios and it just wasn't the same thing as it is now and so that was a form of home entertainment um, it was a form of social gatherings and so i think that was part of it and then as well as just edith's love for classical music she um, attended many many concerts and for all the concerts that she had put on at the white house she attended many many more um, Philadelphia Orchestra, the um, Washington National Symphony, the, the um, Boston Symphony, Metropolitan Opera. And so I think it had to do with her taste and, and that was sort of her um, gift to the experience. Um, one thing that, that was fun for me, and I have so much respect for everyone who's, who's up here because I don't always get to do that much um, scholarship there's a little bit that goes into what I do in conducting, but um, you know we're doing four or five pieces on any given concert, and this created the sense of, of finding, um, of wanting to find out more about different elements. And I know that that's a standard in research, anyway. Is that so? One thing that I want to learn more about is is the musical education of her children and what went on in their piano lessons and why Clinton created that little notebook that he did and, and some of the specifics of, of that um, part of it. And, um, and I'll just close with saying that one of the fascinating things about this symposium to me is that when you think about a giant like Theodore Roosevelt and his presidency and everything that he did, and music is this tiny little smidgen of, of something, but yet, you could do a whole symposium just on music in the White House. And so that's that's incredible that that what they gave was that was that deep. Hal, I want to ask you a question about Bill Lohman. Uh, so he comes last night and he comes up and does, he's very modest. He does just one little story and one little poem. He, but he was there, and, and I don't know if all of you know, but he was literally stomped by a critter yesterday. And he was. He had a giant bruise and knot on his head. He was wearing a knee brace on his elbow. And I mean, he was pretty seriously hurt. And so when you talk about sort of authenticity of cowboy poetry, <laughs> I would have had traction. I mean, I, who would even turn up on a night like this? This guy is stopped by a critter. And he kind of pulled himself together with elastic and Velcro. <laughs> and he walks up, he hobbles up on that stage, and then he holds forth. It wasn't that an extraordinary moment. It was, it was amazing. Cause, and I asked him, I said, why are you here? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I'm probably the, uh, as comfortable here as I would be at home. <laughs> Just very matter of fact. And you know, Bill's an old rodeo man. So, you know, rodeo people are used to getting stomped. And, uh, you know, in my wife's family, they always talked about uh, 
they, they either call it heavy plaster or light plaster. Because at all times, people have broken legs and broken arms. And, you know, my, my father-in-law was stomped all the time and was in hip casts. And, uh, you know, it was really, uh, it's a life, it's a, quite a dangerous life, you know. It's, uh, and I think he said it last night, that it's funny until you die. You know, up until that point, you know, you can make light of it. And that's a beautiful ranching attitude uh, that you know I see over and over again. Well, I want to go back to that incredible Bruce Castanet poem that you read last night. I know you don't have it to recite, to recite, but if you all remember it, it's about you know once the cattle have been shipped in the fall and the coming of the winter and the kind of the the exuberance is gone. Now there's a deeper sort of melancholia as you sit around the fire. It's just an astonishingly beautiful piece of work. But towards like the second last stanza, it's all about death, violent death. Right. And so we have this romance of cowboy life. Mm -hmm. And Theodore Roosevelt had it as much as anyone has ever had it. But when he was out here, he was constantly getting hurt. He was thrown from a bucking horse and he broke the the well, no, he, he, he chipped the bone here. And he, and he said, there's no doctor for 150 miles, so I may as well just get back up and do the roundup. <laughs> but I know a little bit about shoulder pain, but not at that level. I mean, he's living with a very serious injury. And somehow, it not only is OK, you go on, you work through pain, the one that comes up on stage, but it's also part of the cachet, in some sense, of being a cowboy, the pain is part of it. Can you just talk a little bit about pain? Well, I think it is. I, mean, I think pain, uh, I mean, I just think living the essential life is uh, something that rose up. I mean, that was a great learning experience. And it's a great learning experience for anyone I've known who has uh, lived on the land and really uh, lived and died by the land and uh, gone through generations on the land. You know, and I, you know, we all ex we all experience pain, of course, but there is something uh, about uh, you know. I, I know when I I got interested in cowboy poetry, it was a very painful time in my life, and uh, what I found is that um, just the the example of the people around me was uh, uh, something that made my life better. You know. I, you know, I think it did for Roosevelt as well. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Well, there, I mean, there are two types of pain that are so common in cowboy right. poetry and song. One is physical pain, right. the kind that we're talking about with Bill Lohman, right. or in that Scadden poem. You, know, get, you get hung up in the reins of the horse exactly. and you're dragged a quarter of a mile, or you're, you know, a, a heifer goes nuts and, and knocks you up against a wall. Uh, that's all, and, and you're talking about that, but there's also the sort of metaphysical pain, the loneliness of the prairie, the lone prairie. And when I heard you saying the lone prairie, it kind of gives you that sense of the romantic loneliness of cowboy culture. And I think Roosevelt was drawn to that. I'm going to ask Roger to talk about that in yeah. finish. Absolutely. And I like to hear what Roger says. <laughs> <For Roger. laughs> you know, when he comes out here, as you know, he's talking about the starkness that the, the landscape reminds him of Edgar Allan Poe. There's nothing more lonely in the world than riding off on a horse. Yeah, yeah well, um, of course, we have to remember that when Roosevelt came out here, he was uh, seriously depressed because of the deaths of his wife and, and his mother on the same day. And um, his depression may have insulated him in a lot of ways emotionally. And I think that in his case, I may be you know, transferring some of my own feelings on him, but uh, I have the feeling that he enjoyed the solitude. You know, one of my favorite descriptions is when he rode from Medora uh, in winter um, up the up the Little Missouri, to, or actually down the Little Missouri, to uh, the Elkhorn Ranch, and he rode alone, and it was at night, and, and darkness came, and so he had to stay in a little line cabin, uh, and he'd hoped to find food there, and he didn't, so he drank. He always had, it seemed like, soda crackers and tea with him. I just thought, if you're going to bring soda crack and tea, why not bring a little something extra, you know? But he didn't. So over and over again, he's out on the prairie eating, you know, little biscuits and, and tea. 
And, but, you know, in the morning he got out and shot some prayer chickens, and it just sounded like the most wonderful experience to me because he's, he's alone. And sometimes your most authentic experiences seem to be when you're alone. And even yesterday when, when, you, when you were doing the song, Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie, you know, I've listened to that, and I've heard that song for many years, and I thought, and yet I've often thought, it, and that's what I would like, you know. I, you know, I, I worked on this ranch in the Sandhills as a kid, and I sometimes think, well, if I die, um, what, where do I, what do I want done, you know, and, and who cares anyway, because, you know, you're kind of dead with your body at that point, but I thought, it would, you know, it would be nice to be, you know, taken back there, I think, and I would like it, you know, a coyote howling on my grave, so I think, you know, people, people like myself don't write poems about, yeah, I'm going to bury me on the prairie, let the coyotes pick me up, and, uh, uh, whereas, you know, here these, the ones you hear from are, are tend to be the folks who, who don't like that. Uh, that that whole idea, and um, I know the when I was uh, when I did work on the ranch, uh, I just loved being out there. I hated going into town, and I'm a city kid, but I hated going into town because I was just perfectly happy on the ranch. And I know the wife of the rancher, with, uh, the man who owned the place, um, she didn't care for town either. Um, she you know, she would really prefer the ranch life, whereas he was kind of looking forward to the idea of maybe living in town someday. So I think it all depends on how you relate to it. Some people see solitude as lone, loneliness, you know, and some just as being alone. And uh, it's you know, being alone can be very re rewarding, and uh, sometimes it's something that you really crave. So I think it would be hard for us to say, well, what was going on in Roosevelt's head? But we do know he was depressed, and it quite, you know, oftentimes depressed people do retreat. They don't want, you know, the social activities to become kind of burdensome. So it wouldn't be unlikely to think that for Roosevelt, it may have been quite a pleasant sensation to, to be out here in, in the open country. And, you know, he did go out on a hunting expedition all alone because he wanted to see if he could do it. And, and of course, he did. And uh, there were other incidents where he traveled alone for, for a few days. And uh, so I think for him it was quite possibly, you know, a matter of being alone, not lonely. How sociable was he here? Uh, yeah, he, um, uh, you know, he when he came into town, like, you know, getting off the train, he would oftentimes you know, head for the newspaper office, and he would uh, talk with the, the local folks who were the ones who didn't hang out in the bars, you know, uh, and they were the guys who went to the newspaper office and they would talk politics. And um, he would tell them what he had just observed in the East in terms of president, you know, presidential politics or at the Republican convention. And um, he seemed very gregarious. And one of my favorite stories is when, when he was living on the Maltese Cross Ranch, uh, you know, he had two hired hands there. And one of them was dating the school teacher. And Roosevelt was quite young, got underneath the, the window of the room where his ranch hand had his bedroom. And he started singing something about, you know, is Cupid visiting you today? You know, are you happy with Cupid? <laughs> and that was, it's such a weird idea to think of Theodore Roosevelt as, as doing this. You know, and but he seemed like a very social and, and gregarious person, and he certainly made a lot of friends out here. And you know, he enjoyed the roundup, which would be a lot of enforced uh, social contact uh, for a, a few weeks. And um, you know, then there, he didn't. Uh, in my readings of his works, he didn't. He never complained about being alone or about being around people. And I think, of course, in a way, he had this interesting balance because, you know, he was out here, but he was only stayed for a few weeks, and then he'd go back east. So he was constantly, go, you know, sort of swinging like a pendulum between these two worlds. So uh, even if he was out here for a time, uh, he wouldn't have been away from crowds for very long. And when he was here, he was almost always in the company of, of his hired hands. And that's it. Before we uh, turn to the questions from the audience. What's the source of that story about Roosevelt yeah. under the window pruning? Oh man, I'd have to look that up in my book. <laughs> I don't remember the source. Yeah. It may have been, um, it may have been the hired hand. It was Ferris. So you sound like Roosevelt would have written this one up. No, no, Roosevelt didn't. I think it, it may have been a memory, you know, something that Hagedorn wrote down that, uh, that one of the Ferris brothers told me. And, um, uh, but I, I've, I've forgotten that source, but it, it would be cited in my book, because I do mention that incident in the book. So here's, who has the first question? We'll just sit here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, speak up so everyone can hear. Go ahead. What, me speak up? <laughs> uh, going back to the making a movie about Theodore Roosevelt. Um, do you, I can't imagine a movie like Lincoln being made about Roosevelt. Because 
he's so complicated. There's so much to him. There's so much of a, such a variegated uh, personality. Um, what would you want to do if you had, if you had, if I could write you a check and, and get uh, and get Steven Spielberg to direct? Um, I mean, how would you want to? How would you want to encapsulate this guy? This is what you get for me in the movie, actually. <laughs> We can get Steven Spielberg, I don't think. <laughs> That's the first, thing. first of all, why not? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I think he does the, the great man history. Uh -huh. I'd like to see incidents of, of, of Roosevelt. And actually, the, the Lincoln film does do it's that incident of the, the 13th Amendment, which is, in, in that sense, you know, it, it does encapsulate just one part of his personal. But I think it would be great to have lots of movies of Roosevelt instead of, instead of just one. And uh, so if you could write me a check, please, I'd like a lot of money so I can do lots of films about Theodore Roosevelt. But uh, I'd like to see more about Roosevelt's big stick farm policy in films and how he, how he thought about America and the world. Because I think that's, that's one of my favorite stories about Roosevelt because it's, it's complicated. It's not easy to tell. Uh, a story about American uh, occupation of the Philippines, American uh, growth into, uh, before World War I into Latin America, American growth into you know, the Moroccan crisis. A good film about the Moroccan crisis would be fantastic. Um, Tell us about the Moroccan crisis. Though. So in, in 1904, uh, Ian Perticaris, a Greek, um, well, a Greek and slash American, uh, gets kidnapped in Morocco by uh, Muli Arazuli, who is a, uh, a bandit, but also a very well-revered spiritual figure in, in Morocco. and. Uh, Roosevelt makes a lot of this incident, and it turns out to be a big selling point for the 1904 presidential uh, nomination contest. And uh, John Hay pens that phrase, uh, um, Perticaris alive or Razuli dead, meaning give us back Ian Perticaris or we're going to go after Muli al Razuli. And uh, I think this is, I mean, this is a great episode of how balanced actually Roosevelt is as a foreign policy uh, maker and as a statesman. You know, the United States does not intervene in Morocco. It would have been very messy. It balances German, French, and British interests in that world, and, it, and, and that leads to the Al Jazeera's conference, which is he he stops World War One before yeah. it even happens. I mean, that is an amazing story in itself. Well, he postpones it. Well, yeah, postpones it. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, that, for that story to get told, I think would be just fantastic and give us a real sense of Roosevelt, the statesman and, and diplomat, which I don't think he often gets in films. Cool. Yeah, I, 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 I just was, had a, a comment thrown to because I, I thought about this a lot. My original intention uh, when writing about Roosevelt was to uh, do a book about his African uh, hunt. And I read African Game Trails and I just didn't see a narrative there. You know, there's, it's just a, it's almost like a laundry list of things he killed. And, you know, there was never any threat to him. You know, there, there's, and there wasn't an arc over arc narrative. And I was much more personally interested in the ranching years. And it had that tragedy um, of the, the deaths and, and his recovery from uh, that whole period of depression. Though that was a little ineffable, you know, because we're talking about emotional feelings, and uh, they aren't tangible. And in a way, you know, you, you especially with my publisher, you, you you don't say anything in the book that you can't back up that there isn't credence for. And it's very hard to know well what is someone feeling unless they describe their feelings or someone else did. So that, that one was hard to frame, you know, as a narrative, you know, it, it could have had uh, been more uh, a high profile narrative. Um, so I look at, you know, the incidents of Roosevelt's life, and, and the one book that really stands out in my mind is the River of Doubt book, uh, because you have a life and death narrative here. And it's pretty cool because you have a president, you know, or a man who's a former president who's led this active life, and he, uh, uh, he's lost this election, and so there's probably he's probably not very happy. There's a sense of ruin or tragedy about him, and he goes off on this river trip and very nearly dies. You know, it's poorly planned, or anything. and you have that life or death struggle. To me, that's that's a, what in Hollywood they call a high concept uh, narrative or a high concept story, and I can see that as a, you know you. They don't really like flashbacks very often in films, but in that case, you could really use them to elucidate some of where he's at mentally at that time. And at the same time, you have this life or death story in this unexplored territory. What's better than unexplored territory? So I was thinking, you know, the much uh, as uh, I'd rather see my book made into me, I would. Uh, uh, I think that that River Doubt would just make a great film. Uh, I just wanted to throw that in. Go ahead, anyone watch the <clears throat> 
Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. That, uh, Speak up. Uh, this conference has been fabulous because uh, not only has, has Theodore Roosevelt uh, been presented once again as a growth industry in academia, but uh, <coughs> uh, listening to all these people and, and ideas were, were uh, flying back and forth like there needs to be a book written on the relationship between Jusseran and, and TR, and, and there isn't an item. But uh, I, just in talking, I own a script written by Herman Hagedorn about TR and the Badlands, and he tried to sell to the director or the uh, producer of My Friend Flick back in the 50s. Do you guys have that? We do not. Well, you will. Good. You heard it. He was a scriptwriter, and he had inherited all this stuff from his producer. And I never knew about it, um, but it's a 26-minute script, uh, about 30 pages, set in that. Well, there's a book that needs to be written, Hagedorn and Roosevelt, because Hagedorn was involved in so many different aspects of Roosevelt. And he wrote at least three Roosevelt books, four if you count his compilation of Roosevelt's speeches and, and some of his essays. And then he did this documentary film, a little piece of which we showed. And when he wrote Roosevelt in the Badlands, he created, Roger, you can perhaps talk about this, but he created a, almost an indelible image of Roosevelt in the Badlands that you had to work a little bit to deconstruct as you wrote your book, because he romanticized mm -hmm. that period. He um, exaggerated the violent nature of Medor. Just talk a little bit about working against the Hagedorn tradition in writing your book. Yeah, Hagedorn was, uh, in a way, was a good thing because his was, his was about the last book that had been written about Roosevelt in, in, in a big scale, and Roosevelt in the, in the last narrative book about Roosevelt and the Badlands, it was in the 1920s. But it, it did have some shortcomings in that he was really an idolater, and it, it made it very uh, sort of untrustworthy. So uh, when I was reading Hagedorn, I always had to, to wonder, well, did this really happen this way? You know, he, he, I wish I could give some specific instances. Uh, I could have, say, three years ago, but they're slipping away from me. But he, um, um, you know, you just had the sense that he was maybe putting words in Roosevelt's mouth at times and uh, heightening the drama on some things. And also, he changed the names of people who were still living, um, people who had maybe a bad reputation here in Medora. Um, and so when you're reading him, you had to, to keep in mind you know, to translate those names back into who these people really were. And so I found him you know, sort of a two-edged sword, I guess, because he wasn't been a trustworthy. But at the TRC in, you know, in Harvard, they have his papers. And those were great to go through, because that's where he had you know, the interviews and um, um, with the uh, survivors of the Roosevelt era transcribed. And uh, those were very wonderful things to use, because he, I don't think he would have messed around with those. You know, I think those were probably more verbatim. Hagedorn is interesting too because, uh, sorry, uh, Hagedorn is, this thing that I was saying about the movies is really in the, in the eye of whoever make, is making the movie, the, the producers is, is really, who sees Roosevelt and presents Roosevelt, Hagedorn does that too. And I was saying this to Clay, and I agree with you, there does need to be a book about Hagedorn and Roosevelt because his relationship with TR helps shape the way we do remember TR today. There's just no doubt about it. And I was saying to Clay, I found some documents at, at Harvard that Heather kindly let me uh, have a look at. Uh, and at the first meeting of the Memorial Association after Roosevelt dies, Hagedorn gets into a big fight with Elihu Root, the former Secretary of State. And Root wants to present Roosevelt uh, in artistic fashion, so ways that can be interpreted, interpreted by future generations, statues, monuments, public memorials. But Hagedorn wants none of it. He wants to have foundations of Americanism sprouting up in every city of America that are going to teach Americans how to be good citizens. And that gets shot down. And Hagedorn loses that battle. But as I was saying to Clay, he kind of wins the long war about portraying Roosevelt, either through his films or through later monuments. He's responsible for uh, running some of the, you know, the, the national uh, monument in, in Washington, and he helps with the New York monument eventually. So he wins the long war, but it's a big fight over what Roosevelt's going to be remembered for. And he hung in there for an enormous amount of time. There's a Dickinson State University connection here because in 1958, which was a really rich year in Roosevelt production, that's when the comic book, the, the classics comic book was produced. I'll come back to that in a minute. That's when Putnam's 
uh, volume, the formative years came out. A number of books came out in 1958 because it was the centennial, just as we're seeing Kennedy books now uh, this year. The centennial really brought out a huge amount of, of Roosevelt, and it led to a, a couple of things. Right here in Medora, it led to Old Four Eyes, the Roosevelt play that was the predecessor of the Medora musical. It actually began in the, in the early summer of 1958 as part of the national commemoration of Roosevelt's birth. And so if there's a, I found this great little article in the Dickinson uh, Press about this. So they do it, they have it, I think it was for 14 shows in 1958. They do Old Four Eyes in this little kind of pretty um, rustic amphitheater over here. And at the end of the year, they had a meeting to decide whether they wanted to do it again. And they said, yeah, well, there's not a lot of money in it kind of, it's, it needs some professional touching up. And so, but a businessman from Bismarck by the name of Harold Schaefer attended the meeting and said, I think we can make something of this thing. And so the, the germ of the Medora musical and Medora's uh, success as, as North Dakota's number one tourist destination sort of begins in that same centennial year. Uh, but Hagedorn was the national <coughs> chairman of the centennial observance of Roosevelt's birth of Congress uh, gave a quite substantial amount of money to do this in North Dakota. In his final report to Congress, he says North Dakota did a better job of observing Roosevelt's birth than any other state. And he, he pointed to Dickinson State Teachers College, as we were known then, because we had a Roosevelt symposium. It wasn't like this, where they were all here on the same day. We brought people over the course of about a six month period. The governor of Maryland, the secretary of the interior, but the headliner um, on April 12th, 1958 was Senator John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who came here and gave a talk on Roosevelt. And anyway, the, the ripples of this are interesting, but Hagedorn helped to set this up. He set up the first symposium at Dickinson State Teachers College and sort of planting the seed of the thing that we're now doing. So. Roosevelt studies have their moments. I think we're entering a new moment of Roosevelt studies now when there's going to be a flurry of, of a, a kind of a more nuanced revisionism of Roosevelt's life. Go ahead. I don't suppose a transcript of JFK's remarks. We do yes. have we do have the remarks, yes. Ooh, and we published them in, in a short form here, but uh, I just wrote an article for North Dakota History in which we talk about that. And I'll just tell you one quick story about that. There's a rancher from out here named Faye Connell. Some of you know that name. And he was at the symposium in Dickinson. He was a student body leader. And he was at the symposium. And he, he met John F. Kennedy. And after Kennedy, Kennedy's on the rise now, heading towards a, a presidential run. And Kennedy gave a very smart address, probably written by Theodore Sorensen. But, but Hagedorn helped about both thieves incident. And it was actually the anniversary of, of, of TRs bringing the both thieves into Dickinson. And so Kennedy rightly gave this talk about all of that. And then. Uh, Faye Connell was amongst the students there, and they waited in this endless line to shake the hands of this handsome young senator. And he finally inched his way to the front of the line and shook uh, Senator Kennedy's hand. And he said, Kennedy, he was starstruck. And he said, oh, this was a great speech. It was so appropriate. This is a wonderful moment for Dickinson. If you ever run for president, uh, I'm going to vote for you. And so I was interviewing him for this article. And I said, well, Faye, Two years later, John Kennedy did run for president. How'd that turn out for you? And he said, yeah, I didn't vote for him. I lied to the face of a future president. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions here? Oh, go ahead, Beverly. Take oh, well, the microphone down. Just before we leave the subject of a future film, I wanted to volunteer the three of us to create the soundtrack. <laughs> documentary, my first reaction was, what about a 12-part documentary on Theodore Roosevelt, like jazz, baseball, the Civil War, something where you can have a thematic treatment of Roosevelt in each part. I had a dream. Yeah. <laughs> but um, wouldn't that be one where I think you know, Burns is popular enough that it would really, I think, open the eyes of many Americans to really see the many dimensions of Roosevelt, which I feel like we're still struggling. 
you know, people still see him as you know, the big stick, the Panama, and all that, and they don't see the arts and the culture and things we've been focusing on here. And I just think one of those huge multi-part documentaries that Burns is so good at creating on TR would have been wonderful. And I realized I was very much wishful thinking, and I was so disabused of that dream even when I read on it, and I found out that it wasn't even focused on TR most of the three, three three episodes. The beginning, right, right, which is great. I'm happy about it. I'll take what we can get. But I think we need 12 to 15 hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Al. I have a question. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I've, you know, I came to this conference not knowing much about uh, Roosevelt, and uh, I texted my wife this morning. And I said, I have a new view of TR. And uh, her, her initials were TJ, and she wrote back and she said, How about TJ? And I said, You're my hero. <laughs> anyway, that was my. Uh, but this is the question. Last uh, before the performance, I started looking online about uh, poetry about Roosevelt, and there's really quite a bit. And um, I'm curious uh, if you know I haven't heard much cowboy poetry about uh, Roosevelt, but I'm I'm gonna really start looking now for poetry, and I'm curious about how much poetry you you folks have found about TR, and also if uh, since. He loved poetry. Did he ever pen poetry himself? There's no evidence that he ever wrote any poetry, although I think his prose has some poetic cadences yes. to it. Yes. Um, it, it, it. I think you know Roosevelt never took himself very seriously as a writer. He wanted to be a great writer. He kept saying, I hope I can do something of the very first rank. But he thought that he wasn't good enough. And he was made to feel that way by some others. Uh, but he didn't write poetry per se, but the books that he wrote about his time out here are amongst the best books that he wrote. Somehow, the, and Roger can talk about this better than I, but this, this experience of the landscape here really inspired his best prose. And it's a very simple prose. I mean, Roosevelt is a very simple and straightforward writer, which is one of the strengths of his capacity as a writer. We haven't collected the poetry about Roosevelt, but one area that I, I hope that you will follow up, Hal, is um, James Foley. James Foley was the poet laureate of North Dakota. He lived here. He was a Billings County official for a while. Uh, he wrote, he knew Roosevelt well. Roosevelt encouraged him as a poet. And he was, he was a poet and, and also a cowboy poet. But, but he wrote several cowboy poems about Roosevelt. And they're all extant. He wound up, like so many others, cowboy poets finishing his life out in Hollywood. But he's an extraordinary character, and he deserves a great deal more attention than he's gotten. But, but we need to collect, just as, as Michael, you have done films not just featuring Roosevelt, but films that portray Roosevelt by actors. We need now to begin to collect the, the literature about Roosevelt, including popular literature. We, we haven't had time to do it. The poetry is, a, is a, I mean, that's a really great, because there is, there's a, uh, there's a book, there's a book by Charles Town where he gathered all the poetry right after Roosevelt died. Yeah, the poem, Roosevelt is the poet's song. As the poet's song, yeah. And I mean, the, I think the, probably the single most popular poem was Richard, Richard Kipling's uh, Greatheart. Right. And that was all over that, that book and in the newspapers. They keep on calling him Greatheart. I think even Rick Cabot Lodge did as well. Right. But there's there's a couple of sections. I think it's broken into themes, kind of like like Stephen was saying, you know, a thematic look at, at Roosevelt as the poet's song. And some of them are just really fantastic. Um, and I, I, that's, we should have had another paper here for just that, because that would be wonderful. Or at the gathering, it's, uh, it was poetry about Roosevelt, so yeah. uh, that'd be cool. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, just to return to the movie uh, uh, idea briefly, I think, <laughs> what, uh, Paul was saying, I think what actually might work better for Roosevelt would be something like a television miniseries, HBO or something like that that would do. Uh, there's a British and Australian production, Winston Church of the Wilderness Years, it's 11 hours of Churchill basically being thrown out of the government and, you know, hanging out until they get back into the government again. So it's like, you know, like nothing is going on here. They got 11 hours. And it was interesting. It was a very good show. And a uh, good series. And you could do something like that, I think, uh, more effectively to recover it. And, uh, and again, you could probably even get away with using the same actor, someone like DiCaprio, because the guy died relatively anyway. So he didn't want to be 90 or something like that. So you have to deal with a kid and then a 90-year-old at the end. So, yeah. Go ahead. Speak up. I'm just wondering if um, the panel would agree with this or any of the attendees, but um, I've always recognized Roosevelt as being kind of a little guy with a big ego, 
kind of out there, you know, been there, done that uh, kind of guy. And this symposium has kind of opened my eyes to a different side of Roosevelt um, as being quite spiritual and a kind of a romantic at heart. Um, his love of nature, solitude, culture, uh, how he's very humble with other people and recognizing them. And it's a side that I've never really seen before. And I'm just wondering if anybody else sensed that with this symposium. Are you asking us? Or yeah, anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who wants to take this? I, I don't have a whole lot to add to that or to, to respond to it. It's, sorry, I still don't have the habit of speaking in this microphone in this room for some reason. Um, I guess for me, my I was introduced to Roosevelt like everyone else was probably in college and I learned a little bit about him, but I was quickly attracted to or interested to his intellectual side, his cultural side. And I don't know if this answers your question, but for me, that's where I started with Roosevelt. You know, that, that's just how I think of him first. I think of him before you know, trying to sample the hill or his diplomacy or any of that stuff. Um, that's sort of the angle. That's how I entered the world, if you will, of Theodore Roosevelt. So but I'm probably in a minority, I'm probably zero to two percentile with that. But um, maybe some others can speak. Yeah, I, I, I uh, in, in my readings, you know, on Badlands, that he, there is, there is a heightened romanticism in the way he relates to things, and you see that. Well, in what you read yesterday, which I'm losing the autobiography, right? But you know, it, it, uh, there's a, a, some sort of heightened sense when you read that. And I was counting the beats here and there, and I noticed, like in the opening sentence, you're getting like it was like five beats, you know, and then the next sentence are like five beats, and I thought. You know, he's on a cadence here. You know, he's relating to this in a very visceral way. You know, and I'm always looking for rhythm and music and words. And Roosevelt definitely has it, especially in the early text when he's talking about the Badlands. He's came in, and that's why I quoted him extensively in my book because I felt well, he was there, and he puts you there. And we have this record that he created. Uh, why should I, you know, try to interpret this when when we have his own words on it? It's so beautifully done. But also, I think, you know. I began to get the impression here and there that he, well, on the one hand, he feels things very intensely. You can tell that, like, with the death of his wife when he was just kind of broken after that for quite a while. And, but he um, also, he was kind of a dramatist. And, and I think of this when he encountered the Indians out on the prairie, and there were like three Indians, and they were approaching him, and they tried to show him that they had a permit to travel. And he, of course, takes a gun and draws a bead on them, and he sees this as a dramatic confrontation, and they may steal his horse. You know, and, and in his mind, this is, you know, this was life-threatening, and he chased them away. But when his own hired hands, just two of them, after the capturing the boat thieves are going down the Missouri, they went to a village, an entire village that had a few hundred Indians in it, and they saw the village, and they thought, oh, let's go look, you know? And it's, it's like Roosevelt draws a gun on three Indians with his, his, uh, his, you know, his New England hired hands just went over and talked to them and gave them sugar and things that Roosevelt was unwilling to share. But I think for Roosevelt, it was the same thing with his, his buckskin suit. You know, with, with him, everything was metaphor. I think on Myers Briggs test, he probably rate really high on, on the end, the intuitive thing, because he, he didn't just see an object, he saw some, a symbol of something. And so his, his uh, buckskin suit was a symbol. And even, you know, when he talks about the porch on, the, on his, uh, the Elkhorn Ranch, he said, you know, he had a rocking chair that he would sit in and he would read. And he said, every good American loves a rocking chair. And it's like, you know, I'm thinking, really? <laughs> you know, that, that's one of the qualifications. <laughs> and, but you, you get this with him over and over again. You know, the, and so finally I got a sense of a person who really saw life in, in, in multiple layers, you know, so that... Uh, uh, and he must have been, would have been probably just fascinating to talk to because of that, right? because he, you know, he would be talking about the reality of the thing and also what, whatever symbol he saw behind it. And I think that's partly a romantic quality, you know, in a sort of a Byronic sense, maybe. Well, I would go even further. I would say romantic first, last, and always. Um, that's uh, if you if you go back just to his his rapture. When he describes reading the main read stories, for example, I mean, he just he was transported by that kind of thing, and I, I, 
remember the subtitle to, to Brand's book, The Last Romantic. My great disappointment in that book is he didn't develop that theme. Um, I thought it was the perfect theme. That, that, there's, now we're going to see Teddy for real. Yeah, I think I agree entirely. I think he's complete romantic, right? Down to his toes. Um, <coughs> yes, sir. I'm just thinking that uh, he's easy to admire no matter any aspect of his life. But if you want to love him, read, read everything you can on his interactions with his children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Read the Looker book, uh, White House Gang. Read uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Lion's Pride. Read the letters. And uh, some of those are legacy letters, certainly. But he loved his children extraordinarily. And he made them partners. The letters to Kermit. Uh, is is worth the read alone. The letters that he shared with Kermit was a drop. Um, he's romantic, no doubt, but uh, he loved his wife, both of the wives, both of them, and he loved his children extraordinarily. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, the great love of family and children in, in Roosevelt's life. Um, I think if you ask Alice, his daughter, she might have a revisionist view because uh, I was just reading a, a, an account of her again the other day. She said, my father never mentioned my mother's name, and he wouldn't talk about my mother. And she said, in his autobiography, he never once mentions my mother. As far as his autobiography is concerned, my mother never existed. And she also recalls that TR wanted her to learn how to swim, and he threw her in the ocean and said, swim. And it was a terrifying, traumatic experience for her. So I do get it that he's a great and loving father, but there is, he's, a, he's a bully father, too, in both senses of, of that term, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I, on that point, I think it's in the Lion Pride book that uh, he quotes Alice you know, later in life as saying, in describing her dad as a poseur, which I didn't know what it meant, so I looked it up, which is basically a pretender and a phone. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in any comments about why his daughter would say that about him, you know, 20 or 30 years after his death. Why, why would uh, Alice regard her, her father as a poseur? Well, I think, for one thing, Alice just liked to provoke people. And I, met, I mentioned that once, to, I think it was to Plea Roosevelt. I said, I had the impression she would just say anything just to, to sort of uh, provoke people. And he said, yeah, that's probably right. So I think that was part of it. But also, uh, and I, I covered this in my book, and I, I didn't put as much material in the book on her as I, as I could have or would like to have because of space limits, but I did read into her quite a bit. And there are a number of good books on, on Alice, and um, she had a really strained relationship you know, with the family. Um, she, you know, her first two years were spent with her Aunt Anna, uh, and those are very formative years. And then she was abruptly taken away from uh, the, the aunt and, and raised by Edith and, and Theodore because Edith wanted it that way. Um, Roosevelt probably saw her as um, as a symbol of his first wife, and I think he was, you know, he says that the best, he, he offered some advice to a, a friend who had lost a, whose daughter had lost a, a fiance, and he said the best thing she can do is just pretend he never existed and just forget him and tamp down. He says, of course, memories are going to arise, but you can, you don't have to talk about them. Just tamp it down, and I think that's what he did with Alice, and he didn't like to be called Teddy, I read somewhere, that, because that's what his wife called him, uh, Alice called him. And um, so I've always made a practice never to call him Teddy. And uh, he, uh, uh, so Alice had this strange sense, and she did say that, you know, that her father would never talk about the mother, and the only thing she ever learned about her mother were stray comments that she got from Aunt Anna. And, um, and she said the whole thing was very morbid in a Victorian way, and probably unhealthy for her. And I think it probably fed in, and she said she always knew from Edith that she was not the, the family, the inner family. She always knew she was the, the other kid, the outer child. And that had to be a terrible strain on a small child, especially if she inherited any of Roosevelt's intensity of feeling, you know. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, that probably triggered a lot of her uh, uh, rebelliousness or, or uh, her high profileness. <laughs> Later, later in life, especially while she was still young and in the White House, you know, you know Roosevelt's famous comment about, I think I can run the country but, or run Alice, but I can't do both at the same time. 
and something along those lines. And um, so, you know, she was probably a challenging person and had some of his traits, but I think she was probably troubled. And also, you know, I, I, somewhere I read that Theodore Jr. had kind of a breakdown when he was quite young, and it was the sense that, that Theodore Sr., who's really, I guess, Theodore II, would have put too much, may have put too much pressure on him. I don't know many details on that. So there were, I think, some dark things going on, you know, there that maybe would just have never been explored. You know, when you think about what he did to come out here after his wife and his mother died, I mean, you know, one can actually make the argument that he abandoned the child to give to his sister to take care of, mm -hmm. which is a rejection of her, mm -hmm. which might have been something that was festering over the years as well. It's a, we did a, a symposium a few years ago on the Roosevelt family, and it was a wonderful symposium, and we'll revisit it, and I think that, that some of the suggestions made here are worth teasing out, but the life of Kermit is a really remarkable and, and ultimately tragic story. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. had that nervous breakdown. His father said, I'll never push him that hard again, but of course he just continued to, to do exactly that. He forced his four children, four sons, into the war and said, you're not only going to go to war, but you're going to be at the front and you're not going to have death stuff. You're going to get yourself into action, and of course one of them doesn't return. It's a very complex story, but you can't look at the letters without just wishing you had such a parent who would write you those letters. I mean, those are some of the best parent to child, to child letters ever written. And he had a particular capacity to, to talk to children in a way that wasn't treating them like babies, but did understand that they had smaller sensibilities. And yeah, we, one of the things that we can do at the Roosevelt Center that's so great is we can reproduce, we can digitize these letters, and he often draws little horses and cougars and hunting scenes and bears in them. His doodlings are are remarkable pieces of primitive art, but they but they illustrate a lot of Roosevelt's letters to his family. I just had a question. Uh, okay. It seems that we're allowed to ask questions. Yeah, but you have to use the microphone. <laughs> right. I'm a slow learner. Um, the, as you're digitizing and you're increasing your collection, I wonder if you correspond. I assume you have corresponded with the you know the house at East Twentieth Street, Manhattan, because you mentioned the doodlings, and I know they have some of the drawings, these early bird drawings, and sort of early natural history drawings. And I wonder if you can speak to what you have and how this. I've heard about your interactions with Harvard, and TRA, and so forth, but it's a small. I would call it museum, but it, it has some quite a few. I don't know if any of you had a chance to visit the East Twentieth Street. House, but it's quite a few items in there that I think would be of interest. Anyway, I'm just curious what you could say about that. Yeah, I just want Valerie to raise your hand for a minute. Valerie Naylor, the superintendent of the park. Thanks to Valerie, and really solely thanks to Valerie, uh, we got a, she got a Centennial Challenge grant that the National Park Service had, and that enabled us to digitize the Roosevelt Papers in six national park units related to TR. Sagamore Hill is the mother load, uh, but the uh, the birthplace is an extraordinary uh, repository, and so Sharon, if you could just quickly speak to how we're digitizing um, the birthplace. Yeah, the birthplace is in a unique situation uh, within the National Park Service. They are one of several sites that's a unit within the Park Service, and those sites are not related. So Valerie, what would the other sites be in there? They've got the Manhattan sites. Yeah, the Manhattan sites it's called, but it's like Grant's tomb, and. Well, federal federal Hall. Hall. Yeah, Federal Hall. So they're not related to Roosevelt at all, and they have one curatorial staff member for all the sites. And so they're in a difficult position, and they didn't have the, the resources of the staff and to be able to digitize. But thankfully, there was a, a project underway that was being funded by the Levy Foundation in New York to help the Manhattan sites digitize their collections. And so we didn't have any control over what was selected for digitization, but we took whatever they did. And we benefited from it, and the Levy Foundation agreed to that arrangement. And as it's turned out, they haven't been able to get their website up and running, and we have it all published already. So the, the birthplace has been very grateful that the things they got digitized has, has been made public. But that's as much as we have right now. Again, sub subject to staffing and resources on our part or theirs, um, we'll undertake more digitization there particularly the papers that Mike's interested in, yeah. which is the early history of the Roosevelt Memorial Association. Um, that yeah, the TRA's administrative history is there, and we really want that. It's not, it's not the highest priority of things that we want, but eventually we want to be able to follow the Roosevelt um, legacy through the TRA and all of its uh, 
it's affiliated organizations. Their right? records are really very unique too. They have all of the minutes from the uh, women's microphone. group. Yes. They have all the records from the Women's Roosevelt Memorial Association, which, you know, to be fair, was, was in many ways more successful than the men. Uh, even though the men had millions and millions of dollars, they, they managed to get up in two years a building on the site that, you know, wasn't Roosevelt's house anymore. They put a replica building of Roosevelt's birthplace up in the space of three years, uh, which is remarkable. But the house next door to it, which is 26 or, or 30, I'm not sure which side of the street, but uh, that, that became a, a depository for everything that the, the men's and the women's group put together. So really, the stuff that they have is just outstanding. The films, that came from that depository, uh, but they still have so much more. And, uh, and Sharon's so right, they have one person that worked in there. I'm, I'm heading there in February, and I get about three hours a day, and that's it, because they just don't have the money to to keep someone on staff to, to watch me look at the papers, basically. Other questions? Yes. Um, I just was going to say, when I was there at the birthplace, I thought there was a lot a lot there on um, um, a Theodore's mom's side of the family that, you know, I hadn't seen in other places. I mean, I'm no scholar, but it, there was just a lot there on that that was good to look at. The Bullock papers. Go yeah. ahead. I, oh, Carrie? I just kind of want to talk about Carrie's our staff there. member. Yeah, I, I work with the digital library, so I can answer um, Stephen's question about what we have from the birthplace. We, we have 300 and some items, and uh, a lot of high interest stuff. So there's going to be photos and, you know, some of those drawings that you were talking about, we have them. Um, the book, or the speech that he had um, in his pocket when, when TR was shot in Milwaukee, we have that, and you can see the bullet hole in it. And so, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things, even though it's a small collection. It's really high interest, what we have from the birthplace. In fact, um, some of them, we were working with Wallace Daly from Harvard, some of them were on their um, finding aids at Harvard, and they were not actually at Harvard, they were at the birthplace. And so now, I think it's on the Harvard finding aid, it will link to our collection, because we've digitized them from the birthplace. So. Yes, how? Go ahead, uh, microphone down, come on. I'm not speaking till I don't break the rules. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, maybe this is a question for you. Um, you know, I, I went through YouTube and, and listened to all the sound recordings, and there really wasn't much. How much sound recordings? I know you went into the, the film, but have you uh, looked into all the sound recordings of PR? follow the rules from now on. Okay. <laughs> I, to be honest, I haven't. I, you think about the sound recordings, there, I don't think there's that much of them, but they really do blow my mind. I mean, they change the way I think about Roosevelt. When you played the sound recording the other night, I don't know if everyone else thought the same thing, but he kind of sounds like a New York John Kennedy, this kind of nasally dandy voice, and it really changed the way. I was expecting like chocolatey baritone. <laughs> kind of like what you were singing like the other night. I was expecting like, booming and masterful. He's nasally, and I, 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 there's not. A, I don't think there's a lot of sound recordings there, but what's there is pretty powerful. If you can get it translated, it's quite like sick. We will translate. We have eight. Uh, that's usually the number is said to be eight, and they were mostly done during the Progressive Era when the technology was in place, and he was using them as campaign recordings. So he recorded these pieces about the progressive movement and, the, and foreign policy, and then they were going to be circulated around the country. So this is sort of be pre-radio, trying to get the word out, and, and you're right about the quality, it's not great, but since Sharon was saying there's a ninth, and we're going to try to get that, our goal was to have all the pieces and then to transcribe them and to see if they can be, if they can be digitally remastered in some new way, I mean, they've been remastered from time to time, but in some new way to bring out a little more of the clarity, but we can, uh, he gave a, a speech here in Dickinson on the 4th of, well, during the 4th of July, celebration in 1886, and the local people said he shrieked. It was windy, so people do tend to shriek here when it's windy. <laughs> but, but it was shrill and shrieky. It was, it was falsetto, and when he got excited, it went straight up, and he, he did not have a deep voice at all. It was, a, he, it, when he was calm, it could be acceptable, but it, the minute he got excited, which was virtually all the time, <laughs> it goes up, and it's very nasal, and it's very, um, and, there, and, it's, and when he began his career, he had kind of an affected Harvard accent, 
that people sneered at. And when he got out here, he, he began to lower that tone a little because we don't accept that out here. <laughs> uh, but it's too bad we don't have a lot more sound from Roosevelt because I don't think that the pieces that we have are necessarily um, show fidelity to the actual way he would have sounded on any given occasion. Yeah, I've read the descriptions of his sort of staccato, squeaky voice, and I've heard some of the recordings, and I still do have trouble connecting that voice with that man, yeah. even though I'm aware of him. Uh, but another thing I wanted to add is that, um, as you, some of you now know, I have this interest in this early esoteric blues music, and I think we have to be a little careful about trusting what we hear on those early recordings. In other words, I'm not convinced that they really represent what Theodore Roosevelt sounded like. Right. This is very primitive recording equipment. And even those recordings done in, well, the closest thing they had to studios in the 1920s in the Deep South, those blues recordings, they sound much different from the same people playing even 20, 30, 40 years later. The same people we record. The voices are almost hard to connect to each other. So I just think we have to be a little careful about assuming that we really know what Roosevelt sounded like. That's all. Just something to think about. And he was, and, and the technology was so new that he was, in a certain sense, putting on a professional voice for those recordings. I think he was lowering his uh, timbre a little bit for those those primitive recordings that we have. I agree with you. We don't know what he sounded like from the recordings that I we have. I think they could even be accelerated the speed, which would make it sound higher pitched and oh, more yeah. staccato and more squeaky. On to YouTube, use terms. sorry. On, on YouTube, uh, you hear the same speech. Uh, in different in different speeds, so you hear it lower, and people have a choice. They can they can reestablish the speed of that uh, anywhere they want, and so you don't know if that way as well. That's great. So you can still hear Roosevelt how you want to hear him. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very postmodern. Construct your own perception. Construct your own Roosevelt voice. Right? They're all equally valid. Valerie, did you? <coughs> talking about different collections, Shiloh wanted me to make sure to tell you that just two blocks from here at the Visitor Center, we do have quite a few Roosevelt items as well. So those of you that have not seen those before, I want to take the time to go and take a look at that. Including, of course, the shirt. The shirt, the undershirt that he was wearing when he was shot, which um, was from the, originally from the TRA, Peer Association. Um, some of his rifles, some artifacts of the Elkhorn Ranch. We have, of course, his Maltese Cross Cabin, has his original um, trunk, and a variety of things. So for those of you who have not been here before, you do need to take a look over there at some point. So if you're not doing the hikes, a good thing yeah. to do would be to go to the visitor center. And if, if you've not been here before, he had these two houses here, these two cabins, a bigger one and a smaller one. And the smaller one, the Maltese Cross Cabin, is now permanently on site at the Visitor Center, and it is, it's, it's one of the best ways to get a little sense of Theodore Roosevelt. It's a really remarkable thing. So if you're not going out into the park, do get yourself over there. And there's, Valerie, there's a new interpretive film, too. Yes, there is a, new, a film that new as of really last year, uh, narrated by Terry Tempest Williams, and it's a good film. And the Visitor Center closes at 4.30, so that's just something you have to keep in mind. We have that reception at 4, we're gonna have a quick field trip, so. If you're really interested in that, you have to figure out how to work that in. I can maybe give you some ideas. Excellent. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, a, a question, also a, a sort of a small comment, but I was reading the uh, front section of the, the Washington Post last night from Thursday, and it mentioned in there that the Smithsonian now is doing some of its artifacts in 3D, you know, some guns and, and mm -hmm. dinosaur skulls. You're probably familiar with this. And people will eventually be able to print out 3D. You know, you can have your own model Tyrannosaurus Rex skull, which you can print out on your own. I thought, well, we're get, definitely getting into a new new phase of all this. And uh, what I was wondering is, are you also going to include stuff from the North Dakota Historical Society? Because I, I found, for example, the uh, Badlands Cowboy was extremely useful to me, far more than my books would, would indicate, because I couldn't quote as extensively. But to really get a sense of what life was like here then, there's nothing quite like the, the uh, Badlands Cowboy. Will that be available digitally too? Yes, the Badlands Cowboy was published here for a relatively short time, but just at the time when Roosevelt yeah. was here. And Roosevelt, as you said earlier, when he came to town, would invariably go right to see A.T. Packard at the mm -hmm. Badlands Cowboy, because Packard was not a drinker. 
and he was a well-educated man at the University of Michigan, and Roosevelt found him to be a kind of a stalwart fellow and a reliable one. And he, and he also, Roosevelt was one of the great American masters of using the press, a point that Doris Kearns Goodwin makes over and over in her new book. And he knew that Packard would get the word out about the grazing associations that he was trying to create and, and some of his more recent exploits. So we're, we're, we have access to that. And it's already on microfilm. But we're going to do our best to get the, the best possible complete run of the Badlands Conway. If you go back to the 3D stuff, our list of desirables is gigantic. You know, we want to do everything. And so when you go to Sagamore, for example, or to the birthplace, they have all of these fabulous three-dimensional objects. Everywhere he went, he was getting <coughs> golden scales, or a cane, or a pistol, or you know, a, a snuff box, or whatever. And they just have hundreds, even thousands, of these things. And you know, you can't go there and say, I'd like to hold that pistol. They just don't let you do that. And so we would like to use the emerging technologies to photograph and film things in three dimensions so that people can come to our site and actually hold the pistol. They can turn it around and look at the scratch marks and they can see the, the serial numbers and they can play with it. And this technology exists. It's expensive and it's it, it takes a lot of wattage, you know, it, it consumes a lot of memory, and it's not one of our top priorities. But another thing we want to do is to be able to go into the Maltese Cross Cabin and photograph it in every possible angle and then put together a kind of a virtual tour where you can move your mouse and you can move through different rooms and see things. All of these technologies are advancing as we sit here, and they're, they're, they're getting less expensive, and we intend to use all of them. But our primary business is two-dimensional documents, and we want to get that done. We don't, we don't want to get diverted too desperately here. Other thoughts? Yes, Beth? I just had another question about, uh, I'm kind of interested in the DR's impact on future generations, so um, maybe you know, the panel can talk about um, his impact on future presidents. So um, Bush, in his book, Decision Points, talks about TR a lot. And in the context of some of his decisions around invading Iraq. Mm -hmm. and, and it's unfortunate, you know, that his that TR statement should, you know, statesmanship is not emphasized in history. So maybe uh, is there any impact on future presidents that you're aware of? Michael? So he was the twenty sixth president, now we're in the forties. What's his impact on presidents following his time? Every president has invoked TR uh, since Harding. Everyone. Uh, and uh, there's a great uh, chapter in that book, The Many-Sided American, that John Gable uh, edited about the co-option of Roosevelt among uh, future leaders. Harding uh, was great. Harding got Al Jolson to come out to Marion, Ohio during the campaign. And, and the campaign ditty was about how Harding was like TR. I mean, he wasn't. Harding was definitely not like TR. <laughs> Harding was you know, the anti-TR in every way. But he got Al Jolson to come out and say, we need a man like Teddy, and Mr. Harding, it's you. Uh, but I mean, every pre I mean, Barack Obama has done it most recently. He brought out Edmund Morris and Douglas Brinkley and Doris Kearns Goodwin to tell him why he needs to be TR. Uh, and so he goes to uh, Kansas to, to make that speech, to where Roosevelt made his new nationalism speech. Every president has done it. And I suspect every president, John McCain, probably most, most uh, when he was asked uh, who his favorite philosopher was, he said Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, George Bush said Jesus. Uh, so, I mean, George Bush kind of won that debate on that basis, but you know, John McCain has consistently invoked, uh, he's probably, in, in my mind, the one who invokes him the most, John McCain. Anyone else? Well, I just wanted to add that I think, I mean, I of course agree with what, what Mike said that uh, Roosevelt has been, um, I'd say, appropriated to the extent of presidents referring to him, using him as, a, as an image or as a person or as a, as, a, as a hero in the sort of lineage of presidents. But I think the harder question, I think this is at the core of what, what you asked, is how have, have presidents actually been affected in terms of their policies? Is there anything concrete that the presidents have done that were TR-like, if you will, that were influenced by the way he did things. And I don't know that I can answer that question. I think it's a very good question. And maybe a presidential historian like uh, Goodwin or Bashloss or one of those people would have a better sense, again, of looking concretely at 
well, here's how Roosevelt managed Congress, and you know, this president borrowed that. And I, I don't do the political history, so I can't answer that. I think it's a great question um, that you asked. So, two, two quick things. One is Ronald Reagan has to be placed at the top of this list, too, of people who self consciously regarded themselves as in the manner of Theodore Roosevelt, although their politics what were, did he were borrow? Sort of different. That's exactly. my question. But, but, but as to uh, Barack Obama, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt was the first American president to call for universal national health care, um, although perhaps not quite in the form that it is now taken. <laughs> you didn't, didn't have the website. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of questions now. Edith? I feel very strongly confronted to that question and what you were saying as well, that the most important, one of the most important things that you can be doing with the Theodore Roosevelt Center and everything about that is to inspire not only better presidents to be elected, but Americans all to get more like Theodore Roosevelt. I, I think I, it'll be, it'll, I, I think that we're no longer, life has changed so much in 100 years. What he did worked out, it was successful. Now, life is different, whether we are abroad with the, uh, with the military or here, Everything is much more complicated, and life is much more different. However, Theodore Roosevelt, whether it's the environment uh, or physical fitness, I can so you that phrase or whatever, if he can more inspire every American, I think maybe the United States will, having lived abroad, be again what it once was, which I don't think it's been recently. Well, let me just address that in two ways. One is I'm so glad that everyone is saying you guys should do this, and you should do that, and you should collect this, and you should do that. We love it, but get your checkbooks out. <laughs> <laughs> we are very understaffed, and we are extremely overextended, and everyone says, oh, why don't you have the boy with this and that? And we will do it, believe me. All you have to do is pay for it. Uh, you know, we, we really need a budget of about a million dollars a year to do this, and we're operating on less than half of that. And we will do everything you say. They all sound like perfectly good suggestions. But we, we can't do it until we have the wherewithal to do it. So we're, we're trying to stay focused on our primary function. The second thing is about what Edith is saying. I'm going to disagree a little bit. I think our duty is to create the most comprehensive and accurate Roosevelt place that exists and to and to explore him in all of his complexities and nuances, the bright side, the dark side, the heroic, the unheroic, the personal, the public, the poseur, and the man of authenticity. To try to really explore him to the maximum extent that we can in the most honest way that we can given the time and place that we're in. And then assume that once we've done that, that in itself will inspire people to determine what to make of him. I don't think we should have an agenda to inspire leadership. I think it will come from the work that we're doing. And I think that's the right approach, is not to come in with any preconception about what he might represent today. For example, we're asked, and Sharon gets this much more than I do, but we're asked all the time, what would he think of the Bakken oil boom? <laughs> to which we say, we have no idea. And anyway, we don't want any part of that, because how do we know? We have no way of knowing. I mean, it's such a complex phenomenon. And we know that he was America's greatest conservationist. But he also believed in industrialization and economic independence and so on. For us to wade into that would be a, a fatal mistake, I think. It's better that we create the, the wherewithal with, in which each of you can go explore that question yourself. But the minute we begin to commit to his leadership style, to his foreign policy, to, his, to an agenda that he might have in the 21st century, we have cheapened, I think, our, our work here. Uh, uh, I'll yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like, to, first of all, to welcome everybody to my hometown and to say that not only do we have the Rough Rider Hotel, we've done a lot of things to promote the memory of Theodore Roosevelt, and for you golfers, for heaven's sakes, come back in the summer uh, for our golf course called the Bully Pulpit. It's just been named one of the best golf courses in the United States. In a little town of 125 people, we do a lot of big things. Come back. Yeah. Thank you, Shadow. Yeah, on that. Uh, note, I was out there to go to the Transportation Museum today, it was closed. I wanted to go up 
to see the, at the golf course? Because it's closed. Is it not open there in the winter? I don't think there's too much golf in order to go there in the winter. I don't think there's too much golf in the Inside the uh, clubhouse. Yeah, it's only open in the golf course. Okay. Yeah. But you'll have to come back during our um, three and a half week season. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question that goes along with that, and that's for the panel. Uh, Roosevelt seems to have jumped over the changing the whole face of the, basically the, the Great Plains. Can you speak to that? Actually, he does in, in Ranch Life and the Hunting Trail and Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, Roger, he does talk about the ephemeral nature of the, of the open range experience and that it would be natural for this to be replaced by small landholders. Yeah, he expected it to be uh, replaced. Uh, and he, I, I, he talked about that at some length in, I think, several places. Um, he felt that there was a natural progression here and that uh, eventually the open range would be put behind barbed wire, you know, and, and the uh, uh, farmers would come in with their families and, and schools and churches and so on. And that, that he felt that was an inevitable uh, course of events. And so did, you know, Owen Whisker. I mentioned that yesterday that Whisker also saw the open range as a, as a temporary thing. And it seems like we really fell in somewhere in the middle because some areas that are just too dry for crops, you know, they aren't open range anymore, but they also aren't wheat fields. And so uh, I think his expectations may have been uh, either either they were they were a little out of uh, out of uh, reach, or um, he didn't really mean like the, the badlands. I mean, it, it, it's hard to believe that he would see this immediate area put to a plow, you know. But uh, you know, it's rather, rather steep. But maybe he did. Uh, but but he did see that as a natural progression that. Uh, um, that he was part of a vanishing way of life. And he wasn't the only one. You see this again and again. It's a recurring theme among people who wrote in that they were part of a vanishing way of life. And that they would vanish the way the Indians have. You know, they have sort of identified uh, even sometimes with the Indian people. And in the first of the, of the trilogy, Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, 1885, he addresses this subject directly in a, in a wonderful opening chapter and says this is this is an ephemeral phase of development. It's the right first phase. It should be followed by small holders. That means fencing. I don't think he intended that this, the Badlands would be farmed. I think he thought they'd be small ranches mm -hmm. and that the age of the open range would end. And he says it's entirely appropriate that this be so. That's the sort of Darwinian development of, of American frontier life and that we shouldn't feel nostalgic about it. We should take advantage of it while it's here and we should be glad when it goes. And so when I first read that, I was kind of shocked, you know, because that's not really the sense you think you're going to have from Roosevelt. But he understood this and he, he, was, he was really deeply into the Turnerian thesis about the West. And then it, it happened exactly what he said, you know, that the open range did close. Uh, we homesteaded every parcel out here in small acreages. If you go out along the Little Missouri River, uh, every bend in the river where an artesian well could be created, it was, and there was a small ranchette. Um, and then they all were, they failed in the 1930s for the most part, and there, the consolidation movement began, and now we've reached the point where we've kind of reached a steady state of the number of ranches that can be maintained with federal-private partnerships, but this was a, a development that, that he saw coming and, and welcomed when it did. Yes? Uh, we've heard from some of the people on the panel about how they uh, got into Roosevelt, uh, from what perspective, but I haven't heard it either from Roger or from Michael. I wonder if you guys would go into it a little bit. Or maybe you said it in your talks and I just don't remember. Roger, Michael, how did you get into the Roosevelt industry? Okay, um, for me it was that the comic book that I was using as an illustration <laughs> yesterday. That was the anniversary comic, you know, it came out in 1958, it was Classics Illustrated, and I was, uh, back then I was a huge fan of Classics Illustrated. And my father came home one day with this comic book, and I'd never heard of Theodore Roosevelt, but the cover, you may have seen it, um, it was at set for sale yesterday, you, you had it at the Austin's. And it, um, you know, it has Roosevelt on a horse leaping, you know, in his Rough Rider costume and all this, and actually that appealed to me. And then it was full of you know wildlife and cowboys, which every 1950s you know kid wanted to be a cowboy, and um, 
and I, I always loved wildlife, and you know, here, here he was in Africa. So I was just hooked uh, when I read this comic book. It's about 100 pages long. It's a fairly hefty comic. And it's actually pretty accurate. And um, so uh, after that, uh, it, you know, starting when I was nine, um, I, was, I, I had developed this interest in him, and I moved on to reading books about him and so on. And so that was the start for me. I, uh, I came to Roosevelt from a, a negative point of view. I was not a big fan of Roosevelt at all. Um, and I started writing about anti-imperialism in the United States and, and, and you know, opponents to Roosevelt's foreign policy. I'm a diplomatic historian first. And, uh, but then I started reading more. And uh, Serge Ricard, who's an, another professor of Roosevelt, the same thing happened. He started reading more about Roosevelt and then kind of fell in love and thought, wow, this, this is a much more nuanced thing than I at first thought. And that idea that even if within myself, I could, I could love and hate a man for, for things and actions and events and actually made me think that everyone must be like this. There's elements of him that are worth celebrating so much, and then there's other elements that maybe aren't worth celebrating as much. And so that, that's what got me onto the idea of legacy, is that you know, we need to think about how we, we even within one person, can conceive man in so many different ways. So Stephen, I want you to address that question, and then I'm going to ask Beverly and Hal for a closing comment here. Right, as I said, and I, I kind of gave a, a brief answer before in terms of how I became interested in Theodore Roosevelt. When I took a, a college course, which was really a Gilded Age and Progressive Era course, I learned about Theodore Roosevelt and got the usual uh, introduction. And um, I remember being drawn to what he did with conservation of resources. And, but then I remember very quickly, like I said earlier, just finding these little details out about you know, the coinage and this artist that he knew. And of course, I'm, I'm big about going to primary sources very quickly. And I started finding these things. So for me, it was a very quick passage. Like, the guy was fascinating. I knew that already. You know, I knew about the hunting and the wrestling voracious reading and all these things. But quickly, like I said, those little cues I found guided me into the, uh, the arts, and, um, and, and I really never got out of that. I'm still fascinated. I still have questions I haven't answered that I still want to pursue. So um, that's, that's, that's my response. That's about, the, I think, the, the best way I can explain it in about three minutes. So. Beverly, let me ask you a question um, for Beverly. Um, you, you, you've done this because of the sheet music project, and you'll continue with that, and we'll get all that sheet music recorded, and you have been gracious enough to do this lecture for us. We thank you for that. But tell those who might not know a little bit about the Chris Brubeck project and your larger interest in Roosevelt. Some of you, I think, heard this premiere, but it's um, it's a talking about Roosevelt and learning about him. I had never thought about him too much until moving to North Dakota, and then I've certainly become fascinated and appreciated attending these symposia. And um, I honestly can't remember how the idea came about, but it was during the 2009 symposium, and I think um, Stacy Cordering Quarter introduced the idea of, of some of the music about Alice, and so I began thinking about Roosevelt and music, and um, presenting some kind of a concert, and we got the idea of commissioning Chris Brubeck, who is the son of, uh, one of the sons of Dave Brubeck. Um, Dave just passed away about a year ago, on um, December 4th of last year. And um, Chris is known for writing symphonic pieces about historical figures, so he's done ones on Mark Twain, <coughs> Ansel Adams, The Heroes of Iwo Jima. And so we connected with Chris and, and um, initially had the idea of having Clay um, portraying Roosevelt at, in, in, um, in the piece. Um, but it ended up, the concept was a little bit more of a combination of a third person narrative as well as some of Roosevelt's speech. And so Chris created this. It was, I think, supposed to be a 25 minute piece. And this often happens with composers that ended up being 55 minutes. And um, Chris did a lot of reading and, and even struggled, he said, with fitting Theodore Roosevelt into 55 minutes of music. Um, but it's a, a wonderful work, and, and um, we were just honored to do it. We did it here and in, in Dickinson and in Bismarck and in Bemidji, and I believe it has a performance coming up 
in, Cal Fresno. in California. And so it's a wonderful way to, to spread the word um, about Roosevelt's life. The, the piece actually goes from his birth to Mount Rushmore. I mean, it's, it's an extensive piece of music. But also, this has just opened my eyes. I mean, we've done some other concerts um, with music either that was performed in Roosevelt's White House or uh, music of that era. Um, one of Kermit's sons was a composer, and some of that music is available, and that's something we've not delved into yet, is performing some of that on some occasions. So it's just, it's been delightful for me as a musician to have a new um, door opened of, of this connection between history and music and uh, bringing that all together. So I appreciate it and I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you. How, um, I've known you a long time. I'm just guessing your brain has been buzzing for a couple of days here about <laughs> possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I'm, I'm new to this, and I already told told you that I texted my wife. So that's my uh, two hour ago birth into the cult of Roosevelt. <laughs> no, it's it's been growing over the last couple of days. Uh, you know, I I just cannot believe uh, what I was taught in my history classes about Roosevelt because he was so monodimensional. Um, and it didn't make me want to know more about him. And being at this conference, of course, has done exactly the opposite. Uh, and, and researching uh, just the, this sort of brief interaction between John Lomax and Roosevelt's it sort of was the start of it. Because uh, you know, it was a minor, a minor thing. I don't, I don't think it, it meant that much to Roosevelt. It meant a lot to Lomax, who was really bucking um, the, the, uh, the system of, or the, his discipline of folklore by uh, going to the primary source and, in, in the way he did. Uh, and I think Roosevelt appreciated that. Um, but for me, you know, I'm, I'm sort of dedicating this part of my life to writing songs. And, and, I, and so I want to read more, I want to write maybe songs about Roosevelt. I'm not sure where that will go. And I'm really interested in this idea of the poetry about Roosevelt that I mentioned earlier. So I sort of, uh, you know, actually seriously want, want to get the book that you mentioned and I want to uh, look into this further. I was reading a Rough Rider, a few old Rough Rider poems last night online. There's some really nice stuff from the Rough Rider period. Valerie, I want you to come up for a moment if you would. <laughs> uh, first of all, I mean, I just want to say this is the rarest of things to be able to sit in a small room yeah. with an intellectual powerhouse of this panel and have this casual, relaxed conversation that can go in any direction that it wishes. Uh, this is something that I think is unique to what we do, and I'm always shocked at how great Saturday morning is. Uh, just because it's so much fun to get scholars out of their mode, their poseur mode, <laughs> um, and, and into a state of deep relaxation. And they've been playing the blues, and now we know that Roger wants to be buried on the lone prairie. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to make that possible. <laughs> You're going to come back with more films, and it's just, it's just what, a, what a great moment this is. Happening.